The following program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Time of Grace. It all starts now. Welcome to Time of Grace. I'm Pastor John Enter. Just up the road from where I live in South Florida was one of the biggest cover-up stories of our recent history. It actually happened in 2008, but it made national news in 2011. I'm talking about the murder trial of Casey Anthony, who was accused and on trial for possibly, allegedly, murdering her daughter, a two-year-old, and then covering everything up. For over a month, no one reported that this little two-year-old girl was, was missing or gone. And once finally the police officers became involved, her mother said she's been gone this whole time with a nanny. And they pressed on her, what's the name of the nanny? She said, uh, Zanny, Zanny the nanny. A lot of people looked at this and went, man, this is a big cover-up. In Pastor Mark Jeske's message today, he's going to talk to you about a big cover-up, a huge cover-up. They made national news 3,000 years ago inside of Jerusalem as King David had an affair with a woman and then covered everything up. Now, I'm going to warn you, you're going to find yourself connected to one or several of the characters inside of this story. But know this, God's forgiveness and God's grace will also be there for you to transform you. I'd like to invite you to open up your Bible to 2 Samuel 12. And while you're doing that, let me just catch you up to speed with what's happening in 2 Samuel 11. The Israelite army is at war with the Ammonites, but they were not too worried. David did not have to take the field. They let him back in Jerusalem to, to govern the state. And his nephew Joab was in charge of the armies which were besieging Rabbah, uh, which is the the capital city of the Ammonites, to the east, several days march straight east. And David takes a stroll on the roof of the palace and happened to spot a beautiful woman who was taking a bath. Was this a sponge bath and she was just like sticking her feet in a little bowl or did she completely disrobe and David got the the full view? Who knows? But the point is he became inflamed with an obsession about this woman. And it didn't make him feel more tender and romantic towards his seven wives. No. Like the sinner he was, and like the sinners that you and I are, we despise what we have and lust for what we don't have. You all know the phrase, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. That guy's car always looks better than mine. That woman's husband always looks better than mine. So, one of the things that happens when you have too much power is that you get used to getting whatever you want. When you're king, you, own the, you have the, hold the power of life and death over people, nobody can say no to you. His nephew, Joab, did very often, but he was one of the only ones who could get away with it. Joab's off at war. And so David sent one of his messengers to invite Bathsheba to come to the palace for a night visit. Which invites the question, did she go because she was terrified? Was the messenger armed? Was she coerced? Was she terrified of being imprisoned or beaten or worse if she didn't obey? Or, Scripture doesn't say, or did she do what women have done for centuries, find a way to monetize her sex appeal. And she might have gone, hmm, ka this could work well. And wouldn't it be awesome if I didn't have to work anymore and didn't have to grind away and struggle for my survival? If I was on the king's payroll, I could live like a princess and have people working for me and I would have servant girls. Who knows? Either way, she went. And they had their night activities, and then she tippy-toed back home. See, they, those two thought about that experience the way 
in our country, we think about a certain gambling paradise in the desert. What happens in Jerusalem stays in Jerusalem. Nobody will know, except she found out a short time later that there was a little muffin in the oven and her husband could not clearly be responsible because he was campaigning with the army and was nowhere near her. And they had the same nine-month rules back then that we do today. So she sends a message to David. O king, we have a problem. We have a problem. So David goes into crisis management mode, arranges to have her husband Uriah put on immediate leave from the army. He goes on furlough. David contrives some lame excuse to talk to him and says, oh, now go home and hang out with your family. But he fooled David and he didn't. He said, how can I enjoy the comforts of my own home? How can I have a decent meal when my buddies are in combat, they're eating combat rations and they're sleeping out in the open? I cannot possibly do this. He lay outside at the gate. He did not even go in his house and he slept with his servants to at least experience the same hardships his military buddies were experiencing and then went back. David thought, rats! He sends a message to his nephew Joab, who is the commander-in-chief of the army, and arranged to set him up to, to stage an assault close to the walls of Rabbah, which is a dangerous place to be because those people standing on the walls can throw things at you, like rocks and, and scalding oil, and their archers can have you within range. David said, do it on purpose. Push too close to the wall and then suddenly retreat, but don't give Uriah the memo about the retreat. Hang him out there to dry. So David and, his, and Joab and a couple other people knew that essentially this was military murder. David thought, I, got, I have to do this. And Uriah was not just some grunt. He was one of the heroes. If you read the list of, the, of David's heroes, these were the people who, like, who were Navy Cross people and Congressional Medal of Honor people. The list of the great military heroes of Israel are listed in First Chronicles. And Uriah the Hittite is one of them. However, the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Chapter 12, the Lord sent his prophet Nathan to David. Nathan told a story to David, went around this real indirectly, snuck up on David with a story about a rich guy who wanted to provide a meal for a guest, but instead of slaughtering one of his own animals, he steals the ewe lamb belonging to a very poor man whose little lamb was not just part of his livestock, it was his pet, it was like a child to him. And the rich guy stole the poor guy's lamb and killed it and ate it. David, and Nathan says to David, what should we do with this guy? David's burning with anger. The man who did this deserves to die. Nathan said to David, you are that man. You stole the wife of, uh, of a man who had only one. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel. You didn't get this kingship. I gave it to you is the point. I did it. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. He could have killed you. I kept you alive. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. Which incidentally, there's no record of Saul's wife Ahinoam ever becoming part of David's family or household. Uh, I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, which is an amazing thing. Those two halves always wanted to crack apart. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Now, here's the thing. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what's evil in his eyes? So that's major sin number one. You not only sinned against Bathsheba by messing with her life, you really sinned against Uriah, but I have, you have most grievously sinned against me. You despised my word. You knew better and you did it anyway. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. Don't blame it on the Ammonites. You did it. You stole his wife. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me 
That's indictment number two. You despised me and you took the wife of Uriah. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, here's consequence number two. Out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who's close to you. And he will sleep with them in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I'll do this thing in broad daylight. And David was listening. This is a happy moment because we're seeing a transformation. Instead of going on a rant of blaming, instead of minimizing his evil deeds, instead of rationalizing them, instead of trying to lie about them, which are all things you and I do, he admitted it. He accepted his accountability to God, admitted the truth of what God through Nathan was saying, and accepted responsibility. Man, that's hard. That is harder than it looks. Don't blow this up. Pay attention right now. That is hard to say, you're right, it's my fault. Those words can hardly get past our teeth. You try that sometime. It's, try that to somebody you're closest to in life, a parent or your kid or your spouse or whoever, your, uh, your mom. Try saying, you're right, it's my fault. You can barely say it because you don't want to say it because you're so used to squiggling and wiggling around and evading what's going on. You're right, it's my fault. I have sinned against the Lord, not to mention all the other people involved. David was transformed and learned repentance all over again this day. And that's the key to emerging out of this terrible hole he's in. Nathan said, the Lord has taken away your sin. The, this is pure gospel. The gospel is always in the past tense. When we confess our sins in a worship service to get ready for going to communion, you hear the blessed news, the Lord has had mercy on you. Not, not will if you, there's no condition based on how God's watching to see if you're going to earn or deserve it. There are no list of demands. You don't have to get your to-do list and then God will change. You get to hear the gospel in the past tense. God has had mercy on you, has sent his son Jesus to suffer and die and to rise again, has already bought you forgiveness. And David got to hear that. Uh, in interestingly enough, even though he lived a thousand years before the crucifixion of Christ, because it is the blood of the Son of God and because the power of God to connect people to Christ not only can take you and me backwards 2,000 years, it can also take people forward in time 2,000 years. And David was covered and washed in the blood of Jesus, same as you and I, retroactively applied to him. You're not going to die. And David probably heaved a great sigh of relief uh, if, he, if the full fury of God would have landed on him, uh, he would have not only died physically but been sent to hell as well. But Nathan then announces a third indictment. You have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt. In other words, you, you have disdained and despised my word. You have despised me and you've humiliated me because this will get known. And you're going to make me look bad. And the heathen gods and goddesses and the idols of the nations around you will smirk and gloat at what will be happening to you. And my name will diminish. When you and I say the Lord's Prayer, uh, no matter how often you've said it in your life, in the hundreds or in the thousands or the ten thousands of times, when you say uh, the petition, uh, Lord, um, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You are actually asking for God's help that your words and actions will make God look good in your life today. You're going to honor him and make God look desirable that people will want to be connected to him. God had issues with David because David's words and actions had made God look stupid, had made him look bad, had dishonored him and had not hallowed his name. And here's the third and the most, perhaps the most painful of all the consequences. That baby that was born, that little son you have is going to die. And sure enough, that did happen. The child died as an infant. 
So what? It's important that you and I not gawk at this story. I know it's really sensational. This is like a tabloid story. You ever, do you have any guilty pleasures in reading the tabloids? Do you read U.S. or People or, or worse? Do you read, uh, do you watch uh, like the TV tabloid shows about what all escapades all the stars are up to? Do you, do you read the stories in the papers or do you watch stuff on TV about, or do you dig, or do you, chain link around the internet, reading stories and gawking at what really bad, rich, terrible people do and all of their escapades. Do, do you, are you like a little voyeur? You kind of look at other people's messes. Do you kind of clap and cheer when the high and mighty are brought down? I, a lot of people do. I, I wouldn't be surprised if some of you honestly said, well, you know, I kind of do have a weakness for celebrity gossip. Don't be, just, don't just gawk at this story. Because you're in it. This is our life. You think you don't look and covet? Do you think the people within the sound of my voice, whether on television or here live with me today, don't lust? Do you think everybody in this room or think everybody in our, within our virtual world is in control of his or her sexuality? I don't think so. This is us. Do you think we have all had the sense to stop it right here, to catch those evil desires right in the moment? Or have we kind of enjoyed the sweet taste of letting it run for a while and acting impulsively? This is our life in that God shows how he processes what we do. Sin has consequences. You might think, um, that, you know, you come to faith when you're in prison. Oh, I am forgiven. Hallelujah. Now, when am I going to be released? Like this afternoon? Well, no. You have to s- serve out your sentence. You come to faith after years of abusive, heavy drinking. And you think, hallelujah, I'm going to heaven. Uh, when are you going to rebuild my liver, Lord? Well, well, you've pretty much destroyed your liver. There are consequences to what you have done. If you've If you've done a pretty good job at destroying your marriage, the mean hard words you've said to your spouse don't just come back down your throat like, oh, never happened. No, that that, that damage has been done. You've hurt people. Sin has consequences. David heard three grave announcements of the the dogs of hell that he had set loose that were going to hit him and his family. Violence is going to be part of your family story. And oh, did that come true with an ugly vengeance. If you read the succeeding stories in 2 Samuel, his oldest son, Amnon, rapes his sister. Absalom, in revenge, kills Amnon. Absalom then despises his father and leads a rebellion. How true the sword was not going to leave David's family. He said, the son that you were trying to hide and pretend was somebody else's. That son is not going to live, and it's your fault. And sad to say, people do get caught up in the disasters that, that other people cause. It, you don't just suffer consequences from your own sin. All of us, in one way or another, are the victims of the neglect and abuse and cruelty of other people in word and deed. And that little baby was a casualty of David's rebellion against God. I feel terrible for that. All I know is that God, who is totally just, I fully expect to see that little child in heaven who is going to find out that he was in the middle of a gigantic storm. Uh, So just because the baby died doesn't mean that he's cheated out of a chance at everlasting life. And then um, David uh, David was told that... um, Let's see, you're gonna, your, your harem, which you're so proud of, is going to be used by another man in publicly to shame you. And sad to say, that happened too. His own son slept with, his, um, with the women that were associated with David publicly to make sure everybody knew as a humiliation and insult to David. So David's uh, reputation and pride were just going to be smashed down into the dust. But the Lord has taken away your sin. The gospel triumphed over all of these bitter things. And David believed it and the forgiveness came to him. The guilt was washed away. 
the eternal consequences were washed away. He was forgiven and given his ticket back again for heaven. And the Lord not just forgave him, but restored him as well. Bathsheba now did come to live in the palace. And God didn't punish her everlastingly for her part in this sordid business. She became pregnant again and gave David another son. And his name was Solomon. And God put his favor on Solomon. As angry as he was with David, so great was his favor with little Solomon, the peace man. Shalom in Hebrew, you know, means peace. So Shalomo, his name in Hebrew, means the peace man. He was the one chosen. Of all of David's male heirs, Solomon was the one chosen to succeed David. Yes, the son of that woman that he had had that horrible affair with that led to the murder of Uriah. Something good came out of something so bad. And God gave Bathsheba favor and let her live long enough to see her own son crowned as king. So here's, this is part of our life as well. For these are the, the things you and I, where we see ourselves in this story. We are all accountable to God. And don't think you're keeping any secrets from God. Don't think, don't gloat like David. <laughs> I, th I, think, I think I pulled it off. Nobody knows. Don't ever say that. Your God in heaven's eyes are everywhere and they're on you as well. You can't fool God. Second, realize that breaking God's laws only despises him and his word and brings nasty things. And Satan will first tempt you and then he will laugh at you. God's word is healthy and good for us and his instructions and commandments are there not to make you feel like a little child, but for your good. They're fences and curbs to make your life better. And you may well be experiencing consequences of dumb things and bad decisions you've made earlier. Don't get all in despair over that, for the gospel is in the past tense and has spoken God's mercy upon you. And you, through your repentance, as you accept responsibility for what's been wrong in your life without blaming anybody else or minimizing what you did, Accept it and out yourself before God and make it clear, make it plain. Dump the bag. Let him speak his words of acceptance and kindness and forgiveness over you. And then let him do for you what he did for David. And that is to restore him, to put him back on his feet instead of smacking him around and treating him like garbage for the rest of his life. Actually said, David, I still need you to be king. Now, learn something from this. Be more compassionate. Be wiser. Learn about your appetites and keep your eyes where they belong. Let this be a growing experience for you and a learning experience for you. And David did. He became a great king. And Israel was truly blessed. Not by having a king who was perfect, but by having one who was grievously evil and broken in part of his life. But through repentance, the Lord enabled him to stand back up on his feet and still continue to be not only a believer, but also to be useful to God. So you and I are in that same place. And let me encourage you today to repent of your sins, to realize your accountability to a God who sees and remembers and cares to welcome the forgiveness that is given to you as a gift, for it was bought not with your blood but with Christ's. To accept humbly the fact that you may have to live with some consequences of earlier mistakes and do it cheerfully. Don't view that as God's punishments, just part of life in a broken world and patiently endure the consequences, hoping it didn't hurt too many other people, seeking to restore things that you may have broken, but lifting your eyes up to your heavenly home and realizing that as long as you're still alive and on this earth, God still has a use for you. And as he restored David, let him restore you to a life as well of service to him. Hope this makes sense to you. It's, it's guidance and inspiration for me as well. Amen. When I was about eight years old, I made myself a delicious glass of chocolate milk. 
Now, that's not a big deal, except I was on punishment. All of us kids were on punishment. No one could have chocolate milk. I made a triple chocolate glass of milk, enjoyed it, got spooked because I heard a noise, and I didn't rinse out the evidence. I didn't cover it up. My parents were furious, lined up myself with my three other siblings in the kitchen, interrogating each one of us, and said, if no one fesses up to this, you're all getting punished. And I went, that's fantastic. I'll take 25% of a punishment. I didn't say anything. I covered it up. In Pastor Mark Jeske's message, he just led you through how David was transformed, how he learned repentance. Each and every one of us, we need to learn that repentance, to stop the cover-up and instead go to confession, to go to our gracious God, our loving God, and know that he forgives us and he heals us. I'll be back to pray with you in just a moment. God has placed some incredible opportunities before us to reach even more people with the timeless truths that are found in His Word, especially through our video ministry. That's why we've set a $105,000 goal this month, which will enable Time of Grace to engage even more viewers via TV, social media, Roku and Apple TV, YouTube, and your time of grace, just to name a few. Our prayer is that you would help us reach this vital goal by August 31st, so that more people can start living in the freedom of God's incredible grace. And when you give, we'll say thanks by sending you a captivating new book from Pastor James Hine, one of our Your Time of Grace speakers called, What Has Your Heart? So be sure to request yours when you give today. Call 800-661-3311, text TIME to 313131, or visit timeofgrace.org forward slash store. Thank you for all that you do to support us here at Time of Grace to continue this ministry of sharing God's message of love with the world. And let us pray. Lord God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your forgiveness. We need it. We need it because we so often cover up when we do wrong. We point the finger at others. We blame others. We lie. We manipulate. Help us to go away from our default setting to cover up and instead to go the way you want us to go, to confess to you. And help us to realize, God, that your mercy and grace is so powerful that when we open our hearts to you, you will fully and freely forgive us. Help us to have confidence in your mercy and in your love to be transformed from cover-up to confession. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. For Time of Grace, I'm Pastor John Enter. It all starts now. It all starts now. Mm, it all starts now. The preceding program was brought to you by the friends and partners of Time of Grace.